Welcome to this uh, session on uh, theories of social evolution. Um, we have three speakers speaking, two of them through Zoom. Uh, Lowit's going to speak first uh, for 15 minutes, then we have uh, a little bit of time for questions, five or so minutes. And then we'll be followed by David, who's presenting in person. And finally, uh, Vebran Boonstra uh, will be talking on sociologists of scale. Uh, he'll be the final again through Zoom. Uh, just to say at the outset, my technological capabilities are absolutely zero. I've just been told to hold the microphone. Uh, hopefully it won't come to any more than that. But uh, Loic, I will, do, I will tell you when you have five minutes left. You have 15 minutes okay. to speak. I'll just uh, say five minutes. So, uh, ex minutes would good. Yeah, ex okay. excuse me for interrupting you uh, during that part. Okay, so Lowitz uh, from Amsterdam is going to talk about historical trajectories, phenotypical variation, and evolving regimes. Um, what is evolving? Thank you very much, and uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Lowit. Thank you. No, I don't see my... Do you see my screen? No. This should be it. Is this visible? Uh, yeah, it says you're screen sharing. Yeah. But uh, there, we can't yeah. see anything. Yeah. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Yeah? Is it okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I, I'm not from, I'm from a different sociological tradition, and that will come, become clear in a moment. Uh, I worked with Goudsblom mainly institutionally uh, in setting up uh, science and technology studies at the University of Amsterdam, the Beta Gamma Propodauze, where Goudsblom always played a major role, and also uh, in the science dynamics. Uh, Goudsblom was always there at the Beta Gamma interface as an interesting partner. And, but actually, in preparing this, I, I thought, let me do something about uh, Goudsblom, but uh, for one reason or another, that sheet doesn't come up. Anyhow, it didn't work that it's not so clear to re directly relate to it, because from my perspective, uh, uh, which I will uh, explain in a moment, I'm more dualist, and uh, there are overtones of materialism and uh, Monism in the work of uh, most of the people with, to, which, to whom I listen here today. Um, anyhow, that's fine, but let me tell me tell you my story. People who are interested in more background, uh, here are two references, recent references, one in biosystems, where I particularly uh, voiced the difference between uh, Monism and uh, Niklas Luhmann's uh, system theory, and uh, a recent book, if people are really interested for further elaboration. Let me now turn to my main point. Uh, it's important, in my opinion, to make a clear distinction between uh, historical developments and evolutionary economics. Human beings are not evolving. If you would meet uh, with Julius Caesar, uh, we would understand them. We can read his book, De Bello Gallico. Most of us will have read it uh, at school. Uh, institutions and human beings are carriers. They follow life cycles. And um, from my perspective, the observables, the life cycles, are the variation. They develop along trajectories. And they are both, they, that's phenotypical. Uh, and it is, of course, difficult to say, let's now take the genotypical, because we don't know what the genotypical is in social science, uh, nor in sociology, particularly. Uh, just calling for the genotypical may easily light, lead to biologism or metabiological metaphors, uh, but there is an other solution, and that's really, uh, in my opinion, the way social science should go, and 
where there is something independent to add by the social sciences, and that's to take, uh, to develop the analytical construct, but to give them the status of hypothesis. So not to reify them, but to keep them as hypothesis. And then the observables can be the observations, and you can even develop tests, uh, statistical tests, to uh, um, test the hypothesis in terms of the observations. This leads to the conclusion that it is not, uh, if I say what is not, that, that is not evolving, what it then is evolving. And in my opinion, and here I really built on the work by Linkas Luan, the complexity of the communication is evolving. It's, so it's not the, the notes, but it is the coordination and the selection mechanisms which are steered by codes or specific criteria, sets of criteria, which can uh, explain the evolution of uh, society and give a surplus value from the social sciences. Uh, perhaps it's helpful, I use this sometimes as a picture, where I make my point by removing the puppets. Uh, the puppets are communicating and in those communications, structures emerge, which we can, for Ms. Husserl, for example, call horizons of meanings. And these develop as cultural expectations and the sciences, of course, we ourselves, what we are doing, sociology, for example, are driving forces here. They become much more important than that they are from, uh, let's say, a Marxist or a materialist point of view, because they develop not, no longer in terms of realities or whatever that may be between quotation marks, they develop in terms of expectations. And expectations develop much faster and we can, are much easier to play with than uh, the, what is the heart, the sustainable, or the realities. So I repeat, the codes emerge in the communication with the status of hypothesis, because we don't have direct access. We can handle them as the cogitata, and here uh, in the background, we uh, find Russell. Uh, it means that what is evolving is the, uh, uh, com uh, the complexity in the communication. And of course, we are in the situation, uh, I quote here, Giddens, that the invocation of magical uh, explanatory properties uh, could lead us back to abstract system theory and neo Marxism. That's not meant to be. We should not reify our categories. These are remain things which can be in doubt and which we can play with. What now is the, the important contribution of Luhmann that he, um, that if we are not interested in the variation within the selection mechanisms, what is then the selection mechanism if it is no longer in the biological? selection mechanism. We need a different type of selection mechanisms in the case of meaningful or meaning-based processes of experiences, uh, which are central in his opinion, and I follow him there in the reduction and the preservation of complexity. It has to be a form of selection that prevents the world from shrinking down to just one particular content or of consciousness with each act of determining experience, quote, end of quotation. It means that the variants uh, which are not selected should remain uh, available, uh, should remain available for further development. Let me move this here away. away. Um, who shall, this, this Luhmann, if Luhmann talks about theory, he means Husserl, someone said once, uh, brings this up uh, in, the in the terminology of intersubjective intentionality, which is, of course, uh, very much on the Cartesian side. Uh, the book is not uh, incidentally called Cartesian Meditations. It's worthwhile reading. 
it's 150 pages and it's really beautiful. Uh, but who shall ask Luhmann, Luhmann here in discussion with Habermas, uh, it's 1971, they signal the problem without having means of uh, addressing it in concrete research. So Husserl says here, we must forgo a more precise investigation. Uh, and why doesn't he doesn't have the uh, instruments? Uh, he says, provides the world with specific mental predicates, but uh, Husserl says he doesn't have the instruments. In the meantime, I think we have the instruments and that has come only recently. Uh, the instrument come partly from information theory. Um, the Shannon type information theory, which um, focuses so much on uh, uncertainty and the specification of uncertainty. But I took here another road. I took here a road which is closer to biology and perhaps more easily to follow by this audience. Um, so here you have the logistic equation. Most of you will be somewhat familiar with that. It produces, if you simulate it, these S-shaped curves, which are very typical for the types of things we are discussing during these three days. It means that uh, a new generation builds on the old generation, the previous generation, but it is selected. Uh, it builds up selection pressure. Uh, that means that if it becomes too important, then this goes to zero and the S-shape is formed. Uh, it, this is called a recursive type of life cycle in biology. For example, you can see it with the maze map, a typo here. Okay, if we ask for an other mechanism of uh, selection, we have to change this term. Uh, I hope you can also see my uh, my mouse. I'm not sure of that. Uh, if you different, make this term different. This is already a non-biological system. I suppose in biology, this is an important, an impossible system. It is not recursive, it is incursive. And it means that it doesn't relate to itself in the selection operation to itself in the previous state, but to the, itself in the present state. So for example, if you take a technology, the technology is a, a building on its previous state, but it is selected in the present. Uh, so here you already have a different uh, selection mechanism. And if you plot this one, you get an, an possibility that there is an increase and continuing increase where the other, uh, the, where the recursive, the biological perspective bends off. You can take it even further. You can go to a hyper recursive system. Uh, Lo, and... just to say you have five minutes left. Okay, I, I think I can do that. The hyper recursive system is building up its uh, uh, its next stage from from expectations, and only the communication system, the social system, can do that. We cannot do that ourselves. Uh, for example, the rule of law is built completely on expectations that people will follow that. Uh, if you plot the hyper-incursive equation, similarly, you get this uh, plot. And uh, so you see, you get, if you play with the time dimension, and you can also do it in the complexity, I, I chose here the, the time dimension, you get the possibility to, um, oh, I didn't want to do that. Anyhow, uh, given time constraints, I will move on. Uh, uh, so you get here a system which is completely unsinkable in uh, in in the natural science, in the domain of the natural sciences or in biology. You, but it is a very neat mathematical expression of what Parsons introduced as the double contingency. The double contingency says that ego operates in the present. That is as xt on the basis of an expectation of her own next states. And that is itself, and then a t per self one, and the anticipated next state of the altar. 
So both the variation and the selection here are expectations. And if you express it like this, uh, it is not so difficult, let me see, to derive, it happens to be that this has solution. So here you see the original uh, equation at the top, and here you see the solution being developed. And in general, this equation has two solutions, and that has something to do with the social system, which never gives an answer, but always leaves room for making a decision. So here you have still the need to go to yes or no. It is just an example how we can build upon the notion of expectations and get to a non-dualistic, uh, to, uh, to a dualistic, more uh, inspired idea of expectations and observations. What is the practical um, advantage of this? Uh, I think it has mainly a theoretical advantage. I'm sorry, uh, the lower part of what this picture uh, fell out, uh, but I don't didn't want. Uh, I, I, this is from Books and Wiley, 19, 1987. This is these are biologists, and it's well known. Uh, here I, I, I just show it to you to show you the surplus value. Uh, what Brooks and Riley here show is the development of the uh, information content of a system, the uh, maximum information, the maximum entropy, and the realized entropy. And you, in between, you see the redundancy. That's, that's how it is defined by Shannon. Uh, but it is here they write impossible, and this impossible is precisely what's being deconstructed by modern science and technology. We get new technological, new visibilities. So for example, we, we learn, we add dimensions to the system, and these visibilities are developed in terms of expectations in science and technology as uh, enterprises. So summarizing uh, and coming to my conclusions, you have uh, historical trajectories to, in the order of things in the res extensa, and the beauty of science and technology and what is interesting about them and why they are driving a knowledge-based economy is that there is an order of expectations foreseen by Husserl, but at that time not uh, further elaborated. It means that you have to shift because you are no longer talking about agents of units of analysis because agents and units are historical phenomena uh, while we are here the talking about uh, a second order uh, phenomena which no not do not produce information with redundancy uh, not from a variety but inter intentionality are important and not variety versus selection but inter intentionality in interhuman communications and the relation between expectations and observations becomes vivid again Okay, I return for those who really want to see further. This is uh, really an out, uh, the first paper is for written with an eye to biology as an audience, and it has been refereed in that direction. So I hope that those who are interested in biology find it as an opportunity to broaden their perspective and to tell, uh, to take into account what is specifically sociological the specifically sociological is that it can be produced and, and process expectations and biosystems and biological systems cannot. They can process meaning. We, we know that uh, from biosemiotics, but they cannot go that far as uh, social systems can and restructure the system in terms of expectations. Okay, I think that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lo. Um, uh, is there? Would anybody like to ask a question? Oh, like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, you have to use this microphone. Okay. Thank you very Hello. much uh, for this talk. Um, I was wondering. You use the word evolution a lot and the word uh, selection, uh, but do you also look at um, 
at it as a Darwinian process? And if so, what would Darwinian entail, according to you? It is in the Darwinian place a role in the uh, in the initial stage in the upcoming in the what you could call the social genesis of uh, 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 evolution theory. I think we have gone beyond the Darwinian perception. Uh, Hodgson and uh, Knudsen, Knudsen and Hodgson, nine, uh, 2011. That's the book uh, I think. Uh, where uh, they generalize the evolutionary concept. Uh, in, in my case, uh, I'm talking about observables as variation and uh, selection environments which have to be constructed theoretically. And that's not Darwinian in, a, in that sense. Nevertheless, there are uh, Darwinian elements of, uh, which I take from Hodgson and uh, Knudsen but it is a much more abstract concept than the strictly sociological one. There is no survival of the fittest between uh, selection environments like the markets versus, for example, political institutions, which are both important selection environments for sociological phenomena. And there is, uh, so uh, the, if you take too much of a Darwinian in, uh, on, on board, then you Miss the vote of uh, the sociological. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? No one else. No one else. Okay, well, well, thank you. Thank you very much again, Loa. Thank you for your talk and uh, uh, answering the question. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, David Sierra, who's talking about thoughts on the scope of natural history. Concepts for examining cultural history. Um. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I am very grateful to the organizers of, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this paper in this space. I will try to be very brief and present the main points of the reflection I am proposing in the 15 minutes I have, which respond to some crucial points on the research I carried out during uh, the writing of this book that's, that is called uh, Sobre el Paso de la Naturaleza a la Cultura, which is on the passage from nature to culture, which I published last year in uh, Bogota, in Colombia, so I'm going to just show it to you if you want to look at it. It is in Spanish, so, well, maybe, no? Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so it's, it's based on this. You, you can just, if you can just move it. Thank you. So, okay, in his article on the origins and conditions of the human monopoly in the use of fire, published in 1986. I'm not referring to the book Fire and Civilization, but to this article. Johann Gottsblom gives empirical support and theoretical depth to an Norbert Elias's idea that in the evolution that led to human beings, the advance of an extended learning device meant a retreat from blind or automatic direction of behavior. He does this, for example, when he discusses the increase in the competencies necessary for the mastery of fire. He also argues, in a similar vein to Elias, that if we want to understand the situation, we cannot detach ourselves from human evolution in general. Um, nevertheless, Gutzblom and Elias' argument poses a difficult test for evolutionary theory, at least in its uh, orthodox uh, um, uh, version, because they argue that learning devices may have played a key evolutionary role in human phylogenesis. <coughs> Gutzbaum himself makes learning the social use of fire an evolutionary condition in pre-human pre hominid species, 
So he tells us that a civilizing process around fire was already operating in pre-human species, and that this process constituted a condition of possibility, at least in the least last steps of evolution, leading to anatomically modern Homo sapiens, which is a very stimulating argument, because if his argument is correct, uh, then the civilizing processes we Alation scholars study, they have pre-human roots, and they may have contributed to the, the, the formation of, us, of our biological constitution um, as a species. So, in my view, the difficult test that Elias and Gutzblom throw at the theory of evolution with their argument is that they point out somehow its limits. That's the way I see it. So to understand this, one must bear in mind that the process of variation and selection, which have proven in many ways to account for changes in the structures of life, are functionally linked to the genome of the species. Uh, um, they are functionally linked to the uh, to the, um, the, uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the, geno the genome of the species. Um, Sorry. Yeah, they are linked as a functional rational process in which one does not exist or do not, do not operate without the other. But although many attempts have been made to prove the contrary, may, many evidence, uh, evidence on history of knowledge continually shows that variation and selection are not functionally linked, or at least not directly linked, with the change of learned traits as they are with changes in the, gemo, in the genome. In any case, there's plenty of evidence in human history to argue that cultural change is more due to mutually reinforcing condition, conditions such as accumulation, interest, effort, coordination, necessity, chance, to name only these partial processes, than to variation and selection as directing processes. Um, one particular example of this, pers uh, of this uh, Difference is the persistence of magical thinking throughout human history and the eruption of scientific thinking in some societies that gathered the conditions for deepening a process of secularization of knowledge. This was not achieved through uh, necessary through a sele selection, variation and selection, at least in the, um, in the version of, uh, of Darwinian theory. Uh, if the mutually reinforcing conditions that gave rise to modernity had not come together, then magical thinking uh, would most likely still have a greater, greater importance in uh, modern uh, complex societies, as, they always, as it always did in the past, um, and, does not, and it does in non-modern societies. So the uncomfortable question, I think, that cannot be avoided here is, when, what can we do with the concepts of variation and selection if they do not operate directly on learned traits as they do on genetic traits? Uh, so there are different options. One is to try to translate the theory of evolution with its abstract formulas, such as variation, selection, restabilization, uh, pheno phenotype, etc., into the theory of society, as Niklas Luhmann did, and as Professor Lloyd just showed us. However, I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't quite understand what can what is achieved by doing this. I do understand. Maybe I understand uh, his proposal too little, but I do not see how this strategy can shed light on how it was evolutionarily possible to arrive at the, hum at the human forms we know, such as symbolically mediated thought, the peculiar and changing capacity for self-control and anticipation, the ability to force oneself to act according to rules, the capacity to love, and so on. So I have the impression that Luhmann uh, takes these human forms as given and applies the theory of evolution to them in order to, in order to understand the formation of society. Um, with these variables as given. But, he, but this strategy does not allow to explain how these forms could have appeared evolutionarily in the first place, which is the, the question that I, I'm interested in. That's why I, I don't get like with Niklas Luhmann uh, option. Now the other option that, I, that is uh, as a Elysian scholar that I follow is the one that he addressed in his symbol theory. There he argued that perhaps 
it would be better to leave term evolution with its abstract formulas for the process of morphological transformation of the species. It has been done brilliantly in biology, and the term development could be used to account for the sociocultural changes of behavior that are, are properly human. This is interesting, in my view, although it seems to me that in order for this conceptual distinction not to fall into the, the, the division between natural and human social sciences that exists, it is necessary to understand as well as possible in theoretical empirical terms, the transition period in which the organization of the existence of the species went from depending on biologically evolutionary processes to social historical development processes. So it's uh, that's what uh, actually made me try to uh, address this this um, this question in that book. Uh, this transition period, I think, it's very critical for us to understand what happened there. Um, what is at stake in this discussion is the opportunity to provide a theoretical model in processual and empirically controllable terms of conditions that made possible the history of human societies as developmental processes. So as Elias wrote it in his book, What is Sociology? That is, that history has a developmental structure. So th that is, in my view, uh, what is at stake in this discussion. So. In many respects, this transition, um, the transition from biological uh, evolutionary processes to sociocultural developmental processes, like any transition of level of integration in which a major conceptual change is at stake, it's still a mystery and evidence is scarce. However, there are already multiple hypotheses and models which, although made from different disciplines, are beginning to resemble each other. They kind of look alike, and several of them follow the direction that uh, of the position that Elias developed, and those are the one um, the ones I'm interested in, in discussing in the in, in the minutes I still have left. So, from the little I know of Gutzblom research on fire, I can understand that he was interested in the in, in that transitional period between an existence marked by uh, blind or automatic uh, behavior. Um, and one marked by learned devices. So the learning, the learning of social use of fire as a feature of a civilizing process that would have, that would have taken place already among pre-human species is clearly an argument in that direction. Likewise, the principle of mutually reinforcing conditions as an evolutionary dynamic that Gutzblom discusses in his article goes in the same direction, for example, of Brian McWinney's co-evolutionary theory of the origins of language, according to which each new advance in learning capabilities of pre-human species, such as the social use of fire, was accompanied by greater control over the environment and an expansion of, of human habitat, habitat, which in turn su supported, supported further neuro neurological and physiological modifications that allowed a greater control over the environment, and so on. So. Thank you. There are other theories that point to a process of mutually reinforcing conditions as one of the most interesting mechanisms for describing the evolution that led to human beings and their sociocultural forms of change, but I will not discuss them here for reasons of time. What interests me about such theories in this context is that they revisit the scope of the concepts of selection and variation in this situation where their explanatory power becomes opaque. Uh, in this, in in the transition, uh, that is what, for example, neurobiologist Kathleen Gibson does. She does not argue that we have to get rid of Darwinian selection mechanism in the case of the human phylogenetic line, but proposes to concentrate selection on phenotypically, phenotypically oriented evolutions in which the actions of the organism within its environment throughout life can give a certain orientation to the changing process. However, in order to do so it would be necessary to limit the perimeter of selection to a specific type of genes, which are those that initiate the developmental cascade of the organism from the embryonic period, and that is, those genes that would choose, depending on certain inputs from the environment, which other genes are to play a role in the development of the organism and which remains inactive. So this hypothesis seems to me 
to be very suggestive because if we connect it with research that argues that brain evolved in the sense of an increased neuroplasticity, which is an increased capacity of parts of the nervous system to change its structure in reaction to environmental diversity, then we can suppose that under conditions of environmental inputs, such as those provided by social life, for instance, the, the use of the use, social use of, use of fire in pre-human species, and to the extent that a brain-constructed behavior in interaction with the environment is generally more adequate to cope with its changing conditions, the brain construction during the, 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 the first moments of life uh, could contribute could have contributed to inactivate and over multiple generations replace a behavior genetically determined. So we don't really have to get rid of Darwinian evolution to understand the biological process that, that, came, that is beneath the capacities, uh, or the learning capacities that allows for human development socio-historical development. In that sense, it seems to me that this may be the route that would prove that Elias and Gutzblom did put reflections on this issue on solid ground from the, from the beginning. Uh, so there are multiple strategies that we can, with available knowledge on, 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 this, on, on this subject that we can use uh, to understand this uh, transition period in the sense that Elias and Gutzblom put uh, forward. Another thesis that works that, that in this regard is uh, historical genetic theory of culture of sociologist Gunther Dux. I'm not going to, uh, to uh, talk ab about it because I don't have the time. Um, but uh, well, it's, it's one of it's the, 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 the thesis that I explore the most in that book. Um, in conclusion, I would like to just make a few points that summarize my position when discussing the, the scope of selection and variation in understanding the change in the form of human existence or the emergence of human existence as a cultural, culturally uh, determined. So first, I believe that Elias was right in suggesting that in the long process leading, to, leading from animal to humans, there was a transformation without precedent in known human, natural history. So, Okay, that would make make us feel special, but not not in not in not in the in the narcissistic sense. Uh, our phylogenetic line, as far as behavioral change is concerned, and not morphology, seems to have been evolutionarily detached to a large extent from some of the natural processes that define behavioral change in the rest of the line, life on Earth, such as variation and selection. So it somehow. That, and that, this is a hypothesis that I, that I try to, uh, to, to follow. In a way, due to, uh, to natural cell, uh, evolutionary processes, somehow we managed to uh, enter into another kind of process without leaving the, the other behind. Because we're still, we still have, have uh, we are human, we are animals with uh, bones and flesh, uh, blood and flesh. Uh, but at the same time, our behavior, not the morphological changes, they do change without the variation in the genome. Uh, so somehow, in that, in, that, in that moment, there was this, this uh, bifurcation in our phylogenetic line. And this defined a new process of change. So uh, with this, a social psychological level of integration of the universe as something completely new would be reached as a product of a very long evolutionary process. Um, and as a new level of integration of the universe, if we follow Elias' uh, thoughts on the, on the subject, it needs conceptual tools adapted to its particularities. So that is why it's, I think it's better not to use, okay, it's better not to use the, uh, the, uh, the um, variation and selection like very loosely when we are reflecting on this issue. Um, they may work very well as explanatory concepts of change of structures of life, but they seem to have lost explanatory power over changes in human behavior. And the final, oh, well. and the final point was 
that social historical change seems to be better explained by mutually dependent processes of psychogenesis and sociogenesis. But that is another subject that would have to be looked at in more detail in another concept, in another context. Thank you. I think that the difference between biological evolution and social evolution is not as great as you expressed here, um, because in both cases they concern information. Biological information is, biological um, evolution is by means of the change that is happening within the genes. But what is happening in the genes is change of information. That's also true in the social uh, evolution. And it's not true what you said here, that uh, biological uh, variations uh, act immediately. It, it very frequently doesn't act at all. There are variations which, which don't come about uh, don't express at all. It depends on the environment, whether it is expressed or not. And sometimes this may, may take a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, can, I cov cover variations that are, have never come to expression. Uh, but the di difference that between biological and social uh, variations, uh, you have clearly expressed, they, they go much faster. Because the way they are stored, the information is stored in a very different way. And we have access to them in a very different way than in the biological information in our genes. Thank you. I, yeah, well, I, I didn't understand why uh, you said the variation. I, I didn't quite understand the, 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 the critic. I, I, I totally agree with you but I don't understand the, the perception you had on the, on the term that I said that biology, that variation uh, operated immediately. I, I don't re because recall. In one of your first slides, it okay. says that biological evolution acts immediately. I don't, re I don't recall. There's a difference with social evolution that it, it, uh, it takes time to learn, for instance, that's what you said. Okay. Further back. More back? Okay. Well, I don't remember. That's that is not my position, but I. No, I'm talking where? I think on the first box is... Ah, okay. Do not operate directly on range. Okay, so I was talking, when I was talking about this subject, is, is this. Yes. So there, it's two different, two different kinds of, 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 of system. So the, in this system, in biological systems, it, it's functionally linked variation and selection with the genome. That's not true. What is said in the left is not true. It doesn't, it's not true in biology that the variations in the genes operate directly immediately. I'm talking about this, the conceptual system. It's not, it's, not a ca ca it's not a casual causality. It's not a causality. It's how the, how the, how the biolo biology, how do you think of it as a conceptual system? So when, so. It makes a difference. I don't think mm -hmm. it exists. It exists a difference. Ah, OK, I see what you see. I see what you mean. OK. But I, that's not what I wanted to say. I don't. I don't think that it it, it is uh, it is operated directly. Okay, maybe it is, it's bad use of words. But that's not my position. I totally agree with your with your position on information. Okay, thanks, David. One more. Yes, thank you very much for this. Uh, very enlightening presentation. Um, uh, let me just add to, to, to this small discussion uh, which we just now had. Uh, I think the, the criticism is correct, but on the other hand, 
it is also correct that in the case of biological evolution, the, the functional link is much closer between variation and selection on one side and the genome on the other side is much closer than in the case of variation on the, on the right side in the change in human history. Uh, the, the, the link between variation and selection on the one side and learned trait on the other. Uh, it is much more indirect, the, the, the linkage. What, but what I wanted to say is um, I, I agree with the general trend of uh, uh, your solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. um, but as I had already uh, 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 told in a discussion with Hartzblom, I have a small problem with uh, reserving the, the term evolution only for the biological evolution. Because if Hartzblom says that the civilizing process is a, a process of learning, that is a bit of an idealization. We have, uh, I mean, cultural or social development, uh, the term development has too much of a common com connotation of a planned process. Mm -hmm. While the, the, in actual fact, it's very much still a very blind process, almost as blind as the process of biological evolution. And therefore I have, I, I would be reluctant mm -hmm. to just to do the, uh, solve the prob terminological problem, mm -hmm. it's mainly a terminological problem in this manner to say, okay, on the biolog in biology we have evolution and in, 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 in social cultural, uh, in those social cultural changes we have uh, development. Mm -hmm. Development is, 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 has much more similarity I just with want evolution. To say, yeah, one thing I'm, I'm, I, I agree with we you. We don't have very much time. I think that the, what, what should be behind the, the discussion should be like how to get rid of a tel teleological uh, form of explanation. And uh, well, for, for, let's say, well, from the uh, perspective of, of historical genetic theory that I, I, I studied, the best way to, uh, to address this issue historically, we, that we can see it historically, is that one of the best ways anyway, is that uh, we can start thinking more in terms of um, function, function, function relations, functional relations that, that operate over preconditions pre and that let something new to emerge from the from the process, from the process. Uh, like um, it seems to be better that than to pose that one concept will be behind the, uh, the the trend, but mostly like like a system that works on its own. Uh, at least that's how uh, historically uh, this problem was solved in, in 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 the history of physics, as I as I understand it. The the, the model of the machine we had. Uh, it was really important in 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 getting in, ex, in extirping. I don't know if that's the word, but in taking out the theology the, uh, that well, not completely, not absolutely, but to reduce the scope of of the of a teleological explanation. Uh, so I think it's, it's yeah maybe the term so, so uh, devel development since how Elias said. We came from the idea of, of uh, enveloping something that was wrapped, so it was already there. So maybe we need to another, another concepts that allow us not to think of somebody that was something that was already there and that just developed, but something that, from the encounter of conditions, something new emerged. That's like a, like a, the in some ways it's unpredictable, unpredictable, but. In some ways, it's, it, it should be. It could be predictable if we acquire more, more knowledge on these processes. That's what I think. Yeah, thanks. I know 
sorry that you have a question that you've got um, maybe you can ask me at tea time. Okay. 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 Let's move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. So um, the final paper is by Vibran uh, Boonstra, again through uh, Zoom, and he's, he's going to come up here. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Thanks. Okay, so uh, so uh, Vibran, I'll, I'll just tell you when you have five minutes left, um, yes. just to let you know. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks. So, Vibran, as I say, we'll talk about sociologist of scale. Thank you. Go ahead. Can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I would like to start uh, by um, uh, thanking the organizers for this conference about you and Goudsblom's work. And I very much enjoyed all the presentations so far. I look forward also to the upcoming discussions. Uh, but now I'm happy to present you with some work of my own. And as you can see here in the, the presentation is titled Sociologist of Scale. And as you might have guessed, uh, this sociologist is of course uh, Goudsblom. But it also applies to a number of others uh, whose ideas we will uh, discuss in what follows. Um, perhaps a bit counterintuitive, but uh, the variability in temperature on Earth can be a good start for a sociological analysis of the long history of humankind. So you see in this animation how volatile and extreme this variability has been for most of Earth's history. Uh, but the exception comes uh, at the end. Uh, so during the last uh, 12,000 years, uh, the temperature has been remarkably stable, and we call this period the Holocene. And it's a period of grace uh, because it created the conditions in which human groups could improve their chances for survival. And with better chances for survival, our species grew in numbers, as you can see here in this graph that shows the size of the world population over the last 12,000 years. Uh, and here you see a hypothetical graph that has been designed to indicate how during the Holocene, large human groups have become more frequent compared to small human groups. Um, so, uh, in other words, uh, the survival units of humans expanded continuously, as uh, Goudsblom uh, wrote. Um, and this graph visualizes uh, how these uh, units have expanded during the course of our history on Earth. But other ch things changed as well. So, with the growth of our societies uh, coincided also growing use of natural resources, growing levels of waste and pollution, and these pressures in turn changed uh, chemical, physical, also biological processes everywhere around the world. And today we've come to the point where Earth scientists are telling us that human pressures are threatening to change the functioning of our planet. So we are pushing ourselves out from the Holocene into another era, which is now also known as the Anthropocene. And the expectation is that this era will be not as gracious as the previous one. And for me as a sociologist, but also as a sustainability scholar, these images uh, and knowledge raise two questions. So the first one is how we can explain the tremendous increase in the scale of human social life, uh, because that scale makes the pressure so harmful. Uh, and relatedly, how can we prevent the destruction of the natural environments and processes that humans need for their survival? And in what follows, I argue that Goudsblom's work and more generally the theory of civilizing and decivilizing trends uh, can provide important tools for answering both questions. Uh, but let's start with the, the growth of human societies. So early on, a number of scholars pondered this question, how societies could grow if humans tend to be primarily concerned about their own well-being. So in other words, how could humans overcome their inborn propensity towards uh, egocentrism. And the importance of egocentrism was already captured in the Greek philosophical, philosophical, philosophical uh, philosophy of Stoic, uh, this concept of uh, oikiosis, which refers to the circles of identification and the idea that consideration or sympathy uh, diminishes when people or things 
are further away from us geographically or culturally. So how did humans overcome that propensity for egocentrism, as well as propensities for ethnocentrism, uh, which is the concern for our immediate survival unit? And many classical thinkers like Thomas Hobbes or Adam Smith uh, believe that we couldn't overcome these propensities. And Hobbes, therefore, thought that um, growth uh, needed a sovereign and coercion. Uh, but Adam Smith thought that societies could only grow if people could trade with distant others. And uh, over time came to realize that for this trade and the benefits it gave, uh, they were dependent on these distant others. And just as a small aside, it's good to notice how both Hobbes and Smith's idea about human nature is rather static. So later thinkers connect to oikiosis, a much more dynamic conception of human nature, uh, captured in ideas such as the we-I balance uh, or the widening circles of identification. But I would like to highlight that Adam Smith, I uh, would like to stay with him because he was one of the first scholars together with uh, his fellow Scotsman uh, Ferguson and, and Turgot in France, uh, he was able to outline uh, the first conjectural history. And this, in this scheme, which you see here, there's a co-occurrence between greater morality or consideration of others and economic opportunity. And later, Albert Hirschman would call this the du commerce thesis. And in a recent book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, uh, Graeber and Wengro argued that this type of thinking should be considered as a reaction to the great uh, discoveries of in the 15th and the 16th centuries. Um, but what these conjectural histories illustrated was that a growth in numbers coincided with changes in the ways people organize themselves. Um, and this idea you can see in this table where you have a, an increasing scale of social life uh, going, uh, going together with also different uh, ways in which people uh, group together. So going from uh, foraging bands to uh, nation states. Um, and that there, that there is an idea uh, or that there is an, a relation between the scale of social life and its form uh, has, has permeated much of classical sociology, where scholars often identify two types or spheres of social life, a community on the one hand and civil society on the other hand. And um, so my, my, my argument or my question would be if, if these efforts of early but also later sociologists could all be understood as sociologies of scale. And these type of sociologies explain why and how over time societies expand or contract and how these changes in size coincide with changes in human culture. Uh, so, uh, so sociologies of scale can be described by the idea that a larger society is not the same thing as a small society grown larger. Um, and perhaps these uh, sociologies can also offer explanations for this type of growth uh, with this quote of Hausblom that more people are forced more often to pay more and more attention to more other people. But not everybody is impressed with sociologies of skill. In the book I already mentioned, The Dawn of Everything, uh, Graeber and Wengro voice a number of concerns. And first, they question the assumption that growth always leads or presupposes a growing complexity of social arrangements. But they also notice the tendency of sociologies of skill to focus on a single factor as driving human uh, development or evolution. And they criticize also the lack of attention to the reversals of, the, of that trend, uh, the effect of human agency, which includes creativity, experimentation and playfulness, and uh, global diversity. And in the remaining part of the presentation, I will consider how Goudsbom's work, and in particular his concept of the expanding anthroposphere, performs in the light of this critique. Um, so the concept of the Anthroposphere has a distinct quality if one compares it to the more dominant concept of the Anthropocene. And I believe the term Anthroposphere has this distinct quality because it more readily visualizes growth and distance and aspects which are not as apparent in the term Anthropocene. And the Anthroposphere applies to all of human history and not just when humans began to influence Earth system dynamics. And the Anthroposphere as a concept fits with a larger body of work that divides up the Earth in spheres, 
So you have Edward Zeus and Vladimir Vernatsky who have been pioneering this idea. And as far as I could see, uh, the concept of the anthroposphere was developed by a, a second generation of, of Soviet geographers in the 1960s. But Gautzblom uh, connects the anthroposphere to the growth of human societies very explicitly, uh, which makes it into a sociology of scale, in my uh, understanding. And Gautzblom makes a useful distinction between extensive and intensive growth and highlights how growth of human societies comes with more power over the rest of nature, as well as more vulnerability and destruction. And here you see my, my attempt to visualize how Houtsblom's theory of the expanding anthroposphere concerns all of human history, and how he divided up this history in three uh, social ecological regimes. Uh, and he also laid the connection between civilizing processes and environmental sustainability. Um, I've added this slide as an illustration of my own research where I apply the theory of the expanding anthroposphere in a marine context related to fisheries. So I study how fisheries have developed and expanded over time. Um, by way of conclusion, uh, I will argue that Hausblom is an extraordinary sociologist of scale for, for a number of reasons uh, that um, um, implicitly, but sometimes also explicitly um, um, connect with the critique of uh, Greber and Van Grau that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, Vibren, you have five minutes. Yes, thank you. So he is uh, an extraordinary sociologist of skill because his concept of regime leaves room for diversity and dynamics. So the good thing with this word or this concept is that it's not tied to any existing uh, human institution such as the nation state uh, or tribes or any specific technology. So in this way, you could use that concept very much uh, to adapt and match with different sociological or social and ecological contexts around the world. And second, uh, through Hausbaum's use of the triad of controls, he leaves room for complex causality and he avoids one-sided attention to either technology or social organization or changes in values and mentalities. And uh, lastly, the, theory the theorization of the feedback between power and scale uh, demonstrates why the growth of societies, civilizing processes, and the growing human pressure on planet Earth develop semi-autonomously. And this is important uh, because it can help to understand why for us, it's so difficult to come away from our um, um, addiction to growth, or, or what Hausblom called uh, the grip of growth. So coming to the end of my uh, presentation, you might notice that I've talked now mostly about explanations for the growth of human societies and nothing yet um, if we can do something about this growth, if we can control it, and that's probably uh, because it's such a difficult problem. And I was trying to see what Hausbaum himself had said about what we could do about the sustainability problem. And I think that some of the titles in his publications uh, demonstrate that um, he thought the solution could lie in um, understanding environmental sustainability as a problem of civilization. Um, and, but otherwise, I think Hausbaum is a bit ambiguous on this point. Uh, in his publication of 1993, which was uh, titled uh, The Temptation of Excess, it's only available in Dutch, unfortunately, uh, and it has, it has the subtitle that is shown in this slide. Uh, Hausblom identifies a need for moderation, uh, but he is aware how hard it is to, how, how hard it is to limit growth, uh, because he says, and I, I read from the, the, the slide, the problems are gigantic, and we know this, in our better moments, we realize how much is wrong with our lifestyle, how risky our life of excess is, and how little we consider the results of our actions at a distance. We are prepared to admit that more consideration is desirable, but in reality, this consideration often does not reach beyond the closest recycle bin. And I think with that quote, Hausblom brings us back to where we started, which is with overcoming the tendency to care for what is near and dear. So I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to uh, further discussions. Thank you.
very much, Phoebe. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have time for a couple of questions or a question. Very quick question. Anybody? Uh, Viva, maybe I'll just ask one qu uh, question as chair, yeah. if nobody else. Um, uh, your emphasis seems to be on um, the issue of uh, you know, sustainability and uh, scale seems to be a big question here. But it also mm -hmm. seems that one of the issues with, it's not just scale, it's the, it's the you could argue from Marx's point of view, it's the forms of consumption uh, which mm -hmm. are really driving a lot of this rather than scale. Would that be a fair enough point or do you think that mis misreads what you're trying to say? No, I, I, I think it's a good point, but I... I, I I hope that I don't. I wouldn't exclude uh, levels of consumption f w w from scale. I think hmm. scale is a, a very, very general term that applies to both um, increases in consumption, increases in production. Um, but I do think that, uh, with your reference to Marx, perhaps you 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 also uh, include another important point, which which was somewhat implicit in the presentation, is that I think in Hausblom's work, um, but also Elias, uh, there's always a tight connection between uh, scale, the size of, of, of survival units, and, and power. Um, so I think uh, th those, I believe those two are really central, central concepts that are, are always paired in, in their, both of their work. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for all our presenters and thank you for the audience for coming and attending and listening. And thanks very much. Thank you.